It's the Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert in Arlington, Virginia. El Salvador's president, Nayib Bukele, caused outrage last Sunday when he deployed the military and police to occupy and threaten El Salvador's legislature, the National Assembly. The motive behind Bukele's militarization of the assembly is that he wanted to pressure the legislature into approving a $109 million loan for his national security plan. The plan intends to modernize El Salvador's police and armed forces with advanced technology. Even right-wing National Assembly deputies from the Arena Party objected to Bukele's action. National Assembly President Mario Ponce called it a coup attempt. Ever since the 1992 peace agreement between the government and the left-wing rebel movement, FMLN, El Salvador's military is strictly prohibited from becoming involved in the country's internal affairs. Even though the police and military have since withdrawn from the legislature, Bukele continued to issue threats against the National Assembly and its members. Nayib Bukele once was a mayor of San Salvador for the FMLN, but the party expelled him in 2017. He went on to win the presidency last year and took office in June on an anti-corruption and anti-crime platform. Since then, he has repeatedly sided with the Trump administration on issues involving immigration and regional security. Joining me now to analyze the current situation in El Salvador is Yesenia Portillo. She is an organizer with the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, CISPIS, and joins us from Washington, D.C. Thanks for being here today, Yesenia. Thank you for having me. So let's start with um, uh, some more details about what happened last weekend when the military and police took over the National Assembly. What were they hoping to achieve exactly, and why did the action cause so much outrage, even among the right, um, even though Bukele himself has been governing from the right? Nayib Bukele's stated purpose for um, uh, calling for an insurrection, actually, also, and for um, calling, bringing out the military to um, governmental offices um, was to pressure the National Assembly to uh, approve uh, the requested loan that you mentioned. Um, I think uh, ulterior motives that have been pointed to by uh, political analysts in El Salvador and social movement leaders in El Salvador um, have been has been that you know he's deflecting um, and trying to turn attention away from criticisms that are being made against his administration um, for their inability to um, particularly the, the, there's been a situ there was a situation in, in weeks prior um, where the uh, capital was um, a, a lot of neighborhoods in the capital were uh, experiencing inadequate water administration and they were uh, there was like brown water coming out of their of their tap so there's been some folks that um, <clears throat> are linking kind of this uh, situation to um, the questioning of his administration for his handling of of that situation with water. Um, but yeah, I mean the the what he did was call for an extraordinary session. His his council of ministers called for an extraordinary session, and under the constitution, um, claimed that they had the authority to do so. Um, but actually, um, you know political analysts and the, the Supreme Court themselves have said that um, the, the, uh, that article of the Constitution, Article 167, um, can only be invoked in uh, situations of national security and national emergencies such as war or um, uh, environmental disasters, for example, and that uh, the approval of a loan doesn't justify um, the Council of Ministers to call for an extraordinary session. I want to take a closer look at uh, the security plan that Bukele had pr uh, proposed. What is it exactly about and why is it so controversial? Uh, yeah, so the security plan, this this is actually um, a second hundred the first he this is a second loan that he's requesting um he had already previously requested 90 million dollars um for his second phase of the security plan and is now requesting another 100 million dollars um and in addition to these loans that he's requesting which amount to 200 million dollars um that are both currently being um, debated and analyzed and negotiated by the Legislative Assembly, which is the body that the Constitution sets out, um, has the uh, authority to approve such loan requests coming from the executive. Um, in addition to those loans, there's 
um, his budget for this year also increased um, military and security, um, the military and security budget by an additional $200 million from the previous year. Um, so uh, the, that budget totals $750 million without these loans, and that's a $200 million increase. Um, and so we're looking at $400 million increase with these loans if they get approved. Um, and I guess the question is if they're controversial, if the security plan is controversial. Um, what it is is at this point somewhat unclear, um, and it is not necessarily something that's uh, a divergence from uh, the way in which previous administrations have addressed um, crime and insecurity in El Salvador. Um, it's not what they call like mano dura policies or policies that are very punitive that rely heavily on um, the, mili the militarization of police and um, policing heavily and surveilling heavily, heavily of communities. Um, these things are not new. Um, these are things that um, in the past previous administrations have used, um, usually with a lot of pressure from um, uh, the U.S. government. Actually, you know, um, the U.S. government has historically uh, ex spent a lot of money in the region um, to supposedly address crime and violence there um, through drug war policies. So like um, the Central American Security Initiative and the Alliance for Prosperity um, are both um, sources of funding that require or that, you know, heavily um, incentivize punitive and military punitive measures and um, militarization and criminalization of marginalized communities as a response to crime and violence. And um, his plan is not a, like like I said, it's not a divergence from that. It's just an exas exacerbation. Um, so for this uh, third phase that he's asking for the 109 million dollars for, um, yeah, it'll be. Um, uh, there is not a lot of transparency. There's a lack of information, actually, is, is what um, the social movements are denouncing. Um, and as far as what the public has access to, it's even less. I don't know if the Legislative Assembly, like the commission that's currently debating it, might have a little bit more. Um, but as far as what the public knows, it's very, very minimal. Um, but it includes, you know, thousands of security cameras, um, you know, about 100 drones um, and facial recognition technology. Bukina's focus on crime is, of course, connected to a very rich, real issue, which is that crime is very high in El Salvador. Now, just last week, Human Rights Watch released a report about how at least 138 Salvadorans who the United States deported back to El Salvador were murdered upon their return. And Doctors Without Borders also released a similar report this week. Now, um, that the U.S. is sending so many Central American refugees to their death by deporting them is a serious issue of its, of its own, of course. But why is crime actually so bad in El Salvador in the first place? That is, and, um, and do others, such as the FMLN, offer a different solution than just modernizing the country's military and police? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, I'll, you know, I think that um, the findings from the Human Rights Watch report um, point to, as you said, um, a like a condemnation of the ways in which the U.S. government has um, responded to migrants um, fleeing from the region. Um, so the report goes back to 2013. Um, so this covers a time period when the Obama administration was instituting policies of deterrence um, <clears throat> and bringing, you know, including uh, militarization of the Mexican southern border and, and um, bringing family separation as a part of immigration policy in the U.S. as a way to deter migrants from fleeing. Um, and so what the Human Rights Watch report really shows us is that um, migrants were, are fleeing very legitimate um, threats to their lives. Um, and, <clears throat> and of course, um, Trump's, you know, uh, increasing attacks against asylum seekers. Again, it's a condemnation of all of these things um, that uh, detainee, de deportees are being sent back to um, their deaths. Um, and I think, so your question about um, what have been the responses from previous administrations, um, the U, as I was saying earlier, the U.S. has 
played a major role in shaping the ways in which um, security is violence and security is addressed in in El Salvador specifically. And um, the FMLN was hard pressed to find funding for alternatives to the issue, alternative solutions to the issue, and like holistic, um, integral solutions to the issue. Um, and they much, they were much, they were they were. Um, pressured and encouraged to take money for um, militarization, surveillance, and these kinds of punitive measures. Um, they were able to implement um, some uh, increases in spending for um, for rehabilitation um, and uh, social programs more generally. Um, the under the FMLN, the country saw. Uh, uh, increase in social spending that was historic. Um, and so they had the view that, you know, uh, the way to address the crime and violence in the country um, has to include an addressing of the mass inequality that exists. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think that it's really important to understand that um, the, U the United States has um, been playing a major role, not just in El Salvador, but in Guatemala and Honduras and just in the region um, in shaping um, uh, this, this reality of violence and security. They've been spending hundreds of millions of dollars for at least a decade um, on drug war policies. And so what, what has that, that really led us to, you know? Um, and yeah, and then the other thing is that even under the FMLN, um, through the kind of security policies that were being um, uh, championed by um, the Alliance for Prosperity and CARSI, and um, these uh, these things led to abuses by the state. Um, and so there were many reports of extrajudicial killings. Um, by police that had been trained by the United States. Um, and so this is the same police force that still exists today and that Bukele is trying to get more money and funding for. Um, and the Human Rights Report um, uh, indicates uh, that some of these victims were victims of the state. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there for now. But we're going to continue to report on this, particularly also on the Human Rights Watch report and the effects that the deportations are having on the people who are being deported. Um, but as I said, we're going to leave it there for now. I'm speaking to Yesenia Partillo, organizer in Washington, D.C., with the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, CISPIS. Thanks again, Yesenia, for having joined us today. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining the Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.